Hello, my name is Jay Walter, and this is Rebuilding. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, A mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. So let's stretch our minds, find answers to problems, overcome fears, and rebuild our first kingdom. Hello, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Rebuilding. I'm so glad that you've taken the time to listen in today, and I hope that something that's said today will touch you or um, help you in in some way in your life. I have another fantastic guest. Her name is Alicia Lee McMurdo, formerly known as Jen Alexander McMurdo. Alicia Lee McMurdo is a joy-filled, passionate woman. She is the mother of four amazing children whom she is raising to be happy, responsible people. Alicia is a speaker, mentor, author, and facilitator of healing. She has currently and continues to build two profitable businesses, Divine Family Connections and Pure Essence Healing, LLC. She uses her many gifts to facilitate powerful healing and awakening on many levels for individuals. She works with parents and families to create a greater joy and connection within the family structure. She is an overcomer of the effects of childhood sexual abuse, molestation, teenage rape, and domestic violence. Her life is her mission, and her mission is to teach love, forgiveness, and acceptance for every human being in whatever state of being they find themselves therein. She is most proud of her family's accomplishment of living in Kenya, Africa, for one year, loving and serving the people in profound and deeply connected ways through humanitarian service to individual families, many young girls and women. She is a lover of truth and continually encourages her students and audiences to find the truth within and align their lives with it to become the creator of their lives and live their truth. She has let go of being a victim and stands strong in encouraging other women to take back their lives, change their story, and create the life they want by taking 100% responsibility for their lives as she has learned to do and strives to do daily. Welcome, Alicia. I appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you so much, Jay. It's an honor to be here. We appreciate you taking your time with us today. Tell us a a little bit about yourself and about these two businesses, Divine Family Connections and Pure Essence Healing. Um, So you shared a little bit about me. Um, I, of course, I'm a mother and uh, that's my, my first priority. Um, Well, I'm a human being first, let's say that. (laughs) Um, And I think that's really important for mothers to hear. That's been part of my journey as well, is to understand that we um, were individuals first um, and that we uh, need to learn to love ourselves and take care of ourselves first. So, um, and then then a mother, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just really passionate about life right now. I feel like, you know, my life is, been a series of um, ups and downs and a lot of different experiences. And I'm just really coming into creating a life of joy. Um, And I have a desire because of that, because of the experiences that I've had and what I've come through, I just have a desire to help people do the same. Um, And because I really feel like this life is meant to be filled with joy, that we are meant to um, have joy in this life. Um, regardless of the experiences that we've, um, that we've had. And so, um, the family is important to me. Um, even though I have just recently experienced divorce, um, I just see it as a redefinition of our family. It wasn't working the way it was. So we needed to create something different. Um, Mm. and so my former husband and I are now learning how to be really good parents in different households. Um, and you know, family looks different in, in many ways, but my desire in helping families is, is about creating connection, um, learning how to become conscious as a person, 
um, and how to connect with your children and with one another. And so, um, and I think that's, that's a divine, seeing the divine in, in each other and being able to see it in yourself and in another and, and do that. So that's the purpose of that company. Um, the Pure Essence Healing, I've, that's been my company for a very long time. Um, I am, I do do intuitive healing work um, and I do have a lot of gifts that way spiritually. And um, I use those gifts to um, really connect with people and to help them to understand their own mind, their own heart, their own body, um, and how to put into practice daily routines that allow them to stay clear and connected within themselves so that they can create joy. Um, mm-hmm. so that they can have love in their life. Um, right. be- because really that's what's going on. Like when we hold on to stuff, um, anger and uh, hurt and frustration and all of those things, then we're actually depriving ourselves um, of love and of kindness um, of peace and of compassion. And so um, that company is all about, that's, that's kind of my deepest expression of me. Um, really wanting to assist people in their lives of coming into a space of healing in every area, like I've been blessed to be able to do. Hmm. Well, yeah, from, from your bio, um, you went through quite a few things in, in, in your life that most people could just turn in on themselves and just pull away from the world. And, And it seems like you've, you've taken the step forward and want to, to help other people having had those experiences, what, what in those experiences or, or the reaction to those spirit experiences brought you to this point now to where you want to help people? Um, I love that you're asking this question. Thank you. I think <clears throat> what's caused me to come into this place now where I'm so willing to speak about it. And it's, it's actually the energy around it now has turned into a passion for me. Mm-hmm. Um, And there's a few things. One of the reasons it's easy for me and why I have a desire to speak about it now is because the more I share, um, the more free I become and uh, the more joy I have in my life uh, because I realize it's just an experience that has allowed me to learn lessons and to come into a space of really knowing myself um, as, as a compassionate, as a forgiving Um, as a loving, as a powerful being. And had I not had these experiences and had I not been willing to go through the pain um, of of looking at what was done to me um, and going through that journey, I wouldn't be the woman that I am today and I wouldn't have the joy that I have. And I want people to have that in their lives because here's the thing, Jay, we're all human beings. We're all here having this human experience. Mm-hmm. I don't think there is one person in this, on this earth that does not go unscathed um, having some, something happen that is of tremendous pain to them. Um, and, I, and I just want people to see that there, you can come out on the other side. And not only can you come out on the other side, um, but it can actually become a gift in your life. And... Um, what made me be willing to go through it is I just was in so much pain for so long. Um, and I didn't, and it was starting to hurt my children. Mm. And, um, and I didn't want, I didn't want to do that anymore. When I got to a point after my third child that I literally wanted to drive off of a cliff because Mm. I was in so much pain. Yeah. Um, and God stopped me. There was no one in that car. Um, and it was, it was his voice that stopped me from driving off that cliff. Mm. Um, if I'll just share the story really quick with you, okay. if that's okay. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. So, um, I, you know, I struggled with depression for 15 years and I, it was directly connected with all of the, um, the pain and from these experiences. Um, mm. and, uh, yeah, after my third child, the postpartum and that was just so much. I literally went to a cliff one night and had the intention to just be done. I just, I, the pain was so intense, the emotional pain, Mm -hmm. um, of just 
not feeling good enough, feeling like I just couldn't go on anymore, you know, um, was so intense that I just wanted to be done. And so I sat in my car on the edge of a cliff and I was pleading with God, please help me. You know, um, I feel like this is my only option. I don't want to do this, but I'm in so much pain. I don't know what else to do. And I sat there and all of a sudden the radio turned on and this song came on and the song, the words to the song, he hears me. He hears me when I'm crying in the night. He hears me when my soul longs to fight. And uh, I sat there (laughs) and because there was nobody else in that car and that radio was not on. And in that moment, I was like, okay. And he said to me, your time is not finished. You have so much to do. And there are so many people you can help. And I said, okay, then you, then I need your help. And I need you to help me get off this cliff. And I need you to show me how to get through this. And so from that moment, then I started having different tools come into my life to help me um, forgive. Um, to help me release all of the pain, the emotional pain, um, and really start to come into a place of living. So um, I'm a fighter. That's my spirit. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like it. (laughs) So, um, and I think when you go, when you get to a place of pain, that painful, you really do have two choices. You can either like you said, go inward and you can just keep dying and let pieces of yourself die and get to a point to then where you just, you just are, Mm -hmm. or you can choose to move through the pain, um, and really start to do that process and then start to embrace what's coming after that. I have a really good friend that says, um, amazing things live on the other side of fear. And that is something that has really helped me. When I hit fear, I'm like, okay, there's something amazing on the other side of that. (laughs) And it helps me just be like, okay, I'm going to push through this because I want that amazingness. Yeah. Kind of what started this podcast is reading a book called Feel the Fear, But Do It Anyway. And, And so it is the same thing, this new thing this place I need to go is kind of scary and I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to get through that. And it sounds like the experience that you had, you face that fear and you got new tools and you learned how to overcome this situation or the situations as they come up. And like you say, the other side of that fear is some pretty amazing stuff. I never would have met the people I've met if I'd stayed in my fear of, of not talking to people and and then getting to know people and sharing their messages. Yeah, absolutely. It's just being willing to do that, you know, for sure. So before you overcame these obstacles, did you feel like you were all alone and the only person that ever felt the way you did or... Did you know in your heart that there are other people out there that were like you? You know, I think going through the depression, being in a depression for that long, um, you want to hide because depression really comes from um, the belief of feeling that you're not lovable, uh, that you're not worthy of love, that you're not good enough. um, And that's really where depression starts. It starts uh, spiritually and emotionally first um, because we buy into those lies. And so many of those come from, you know, from the abuse. Um, We form those beliefs about ourselves um, when, when we go through those experiences. And even when we don't, that tends to be, um, I didn't feel so alone dealing with the sexual abuse, those memories, Uh, because I had a lot of people around me. Those memories came out when I was 18. And when I left my home, when I was in a safe place, um, the memories of the, um, the abuse and the molestation and the rape, 
um, were able to come. And I was surrounded by people who were able to help me. Um, and so I knew that I wasn't alone in that. Um, and I also were, was hearing other people's stories. Um, and it's really interesting, even now, there's so many people, even now, I just got asked to write my story um, in a collaborative book. Mm. Um, because so many people are, you know, starting to come out. Um, so I would just say anyone that feels like they're going through that, um, where they're recognizing or they have been abused or they are being abused, um, you're never alone. You are not alone. And there are, there are people and there are support systems and, um, and the power lies in thinking that you are and, and hiding it. Um, and so that's why I, that's why I share very openly, uh, because people need to know they're not alone. And the, um, the chains break when you start to speak. Right. And that's really, really important. Um, you know, so I, I didn't feel alone during that time. Um, but the depression was a time where I did because I hid because I thought, because when I would go out in public, I would put on a great, a great face, you know, because mm-hmm. um, I grew up as a performer. I was on dance teams and I would sing and I had been taught how to perform, you know. Right. Yeah. So when I went out in public, I put on a, I put on a pretty good like, yeah, I'm happy, you know, <laughs> Even though I would avoid a lot of situations. And towards the end there, I just never left my house. Mm. Um, And so the depression got worse because I had no interaction. And so I literally was just left with my thoughts, my, my horrible, um, thoughts on a daily basis. And that is when I felt the most alone. And that is when I felt, when I found myself on that cliff, because I really thought nobody loves me. Nobody's going to want to help me. I, who would want to help me in this state? Who would, who would even want to, I mean, my husband doesn't even want to love me. He was having affairs at that time. Mm. Um, and he was having problems with pornography. And so I just, it was just this, you know, so during that time I did feel alone. Um, yeah. and it was that experience on the cliff, um, that was like, okay, <laughs> God <laughs> is right here. I am yeah. not and if he is saying there is more for you like and if he is using his power to speak to me and there's no one else then then I'm not alone and so right. yeah okay um let's switch gears a little bit you talk about living in Kenya for a year tell me about your experience and and what you did and and why you went yeah absolutely and that that's a beautiful thing. So I let's, I want to kind of attach that to, um, actually coming out of our coming out of, um, all of the abuse and, and forgiving and releasing and healing from all of that. Then what it did is it allowed me to step into, um, creating Mm -hmm. the things that I really wanted because I wasn't putting energy in just surviving. I was forgiving and letting go of all of those, um, those faulty beliefs, um, all of the pain that was keeping me stuck. And so I was stepping into love, um, and really learning that I'm a, I'm a being of love and how much I love people and how much I want to assist people. Mm. Um, and it was through, uh, overcoming that, but then I started into asking for what I wanted and creating. And Kenya was the manifestation of a dream that I had had since a very young age, that I had wanted to travel the world, that I wanted to help people. Um, and so here is my dream coming true at 41 because <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to teach people. I wanted to teach people truth um, and I wanted to serve them. Like that was my heart. As I was coming out of all of this abuse and I was healing and I was seeing who I was, I realized my heart was, I just want to love people. And so that going to Kenya was the manifestation at 41 years old. And it wasn't me. It was our entire family. Oh, wow. Um, and we just went and we loved those people. We lived in the community with them. Mm-hmm. Um, we were their neighbors. Uh, they were our friends. We were their friends. 
Um, we broke down so many of those walls between not only between different cultures, but between different skin color, between different tribes. Um, we just broke down the walls just by loving them and allowing them to love us. Um, and we served them. We, uh, we built garden boxes for families. We, we represented an organization called 100 Humanitarians. Mm -hmm. um, we had projects already. I had gone a year before on my own and done an expedition there. Um, and then a year later, we took our family um, and we continued some of those projects, building garden boxes for families, mentoring families, helping build water storage systems for families. Um, my 12-year-old daughter and I traveled quite often to girls' schools to educate them on their bodies. Um, we were with the Days for Girls program where it provides reusable sanitary napkins um, because for girls in Kenya, they don't have they don't have those things. Something as simple as a sanitary napkin, um, which means the world to them. A sanitary napkin to a young girl keeps them in school. Mm -hmm. It keeps them free from being married off at an early age. It keeps them free from actually being raped. Um, and so uh, we spent a lot of time just uh, loving on these girls and uh, really just being there for them. And some one of the most beautiful experiences is when I got to go to a rescue center. Um, there were 72 girls there. These young women were the ages from 11 to 18 and they had all ran away from their homes because they did not want to be married off um, and they did not want to go through a practice which was a female circumcision um, it was a it's a ritual um, mm -hmm. but they did not want to participate and so they literally ran away from their homes and they've been put up in this rescue center and I had the opportunity to speak with them even though there's a language barrier I had an interpreter and this was one of the highlights of my trip. This was a full circle for me um, because I got to, to stand in front of these young women and share with them what God had brought me through, um, mm -hmm. that he had brought me through, you know, the childhood abuse, the rape, and um, being able to stand before them and share with them that and encourage them to be strong. And it was the most beautiful thing because all of the walls – because these girls are scared. Yeah. Um, they're scared and they don't share their stories. You don't speak about these things. Um, kind of a little bit like here, but you know, you just don't speak about these things with people. And um, it was really beautiful because all the walls came down and they were crying um, and I was crying. And these girls that had never shared their story with anyone, they, they requested through an interpreter, we want to speak with you. Can we speak privately with you? We want to share our stories with you. And so it was such a beautiful moment because it was connection. Mm -hmm. It was connection, soul to soul and heart to heart. And that, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm wanting to create. And um, it was so beautiful because had I not had these experiences in my life, had I not had the opportunity to move through these and to forgive and to, um, then I would not have had that beautiful opportunity to connect with these young girls and to assist them in being able to see you can do this. Yeah. Like, even though this has happened to you, even though you've been through this. And I talked to an 11 year old girl who had been raped by several men um, and being able to sit with her and understand and say, you can do this. Like, and for her to look at me and say, because you shared your story with me, because you showed me that this was possible. I believe that I, that I can do this, that I can go to school, that I can change my life, that I can become a different person, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was a that was a really um, defining moment for yeah. me. So well, again, giving those girls a safe space where they can talk and and feel like they were heard. That's that's amazing experience for uh, you, I can imagine, and for them as well. It was, it was, and in fact, I am writing a book. I have two books, but this is <laughs> one. <laughs> this is one actually. It's in the making. I've 
been playing around with it for a while, but I'm actually um, sharing, going to uh, share some stories of the miracles and the those type of connections um, that we had in Kenya. So just to inspire people. Yeah. yeah. You know. So you took your whole family to Kenya. How did this experience affect your children? You know, I love that question because uh, so many people had so many mixed uh, emotions about us going. And, you know, of course, we got so many different opinions. Um, yeah. Uh, which is fine, but we're, we live our lives. We choose our lives, you know, um, the thing that was really beautiful. So there were some positives and then of course there were some, some negatives. There were some lessons. Um, I, I call them lessons now. I don't really call them negatives, but there, there were some <laughs> lessons. <laughs> um, the beautiful thing is, is that my children got to at a very young age experience a completely different culture. Um, and they got to learn how to love, um, and how to accept, um, and how to give from their hearts. And they learned at a young age, um, how it felt to really give to another person and to see, um, other people thrive from their actions, Mm. Um, and from their willingness to sacrifice, uh, yeah. because my children sacrificed. Mm, they did. Yeah. They sacrificed a lot. We sold everything and lived in a trailer for four months. Wow. Uh, pretty much to, to save for those plane tickets to get mm-hmm. over there. And they did that. They were willing to as well. And then they also put their lives on hold to come over um, and to serve. Um, and to be there. Um, and they, my children have seen things that most people will not see in their lifetime. They have seen yeah. poverty. Um, they have heard of violence. Um, they have experienced sitting with children and hearing stories of these children watching their parents be shot in front of them. Mm. Um, and my children seeing them and, and, and sitting with these children. Um, and so they were exposed to <laughs> some of the unpleasant things of the world. But at the same time, in that moment, they had the opportunity to love and have compassion yeah. um, and learn a different language. It was really interesting because they didn't, we didn't know the language going over there. And I watched my children interact with these other children that just wanted to see them because over there, white people um, are, they're unique. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of the places that we went, they had never seen white people. And so they literally just were watching my children like they were animals in a zoo. (laughs) (laughs) And my children did not like that. That was one thing for them that was extremely hard. Um, because we would go to schools and the kids would gather around them. They would want to touch their skin. They would want to touch their hair. Um, and so we had to do a lot of educating of like, see, they have arms like you have arms. They have eyes like you have eyes, (laughs) you know, their hair is different, but it's hair. Um, and so we're, we're there, we're the same, we're human beings and we have the same heart, but we just look differently. Um, but that, that was a difficult thing for them um, because they were immediately at a young age put in a place where they were put on a pedestal um, and they were put in a place of power. Um, because when they see most, not in all the areas, but in the poverty stricken areas, they see white people as saviors in a way. Well, they're going to come and save us. They have money. Right. Um, and so they give us power. And so that was another area that was hard for my kids. They had to learn just because they could didn't mean that they should. Right. Um, and there, it was their own compass guiding them because, uh, the people around them wanted to give them anything and everything. Um, and so, uh, those were some of the, the pros and cons, um, mm. for them. So another, another pro was they really learned to lean on one another, um, as brother and sisters. So I have one daughter, she's my oldest, she's 12. Well, she's almost 14 now. Um, and then three boys. Mm. So, um, they learned to really, uh, to really come together, 
um, yeah. and, and take care of one another. So, um, but they also got to experience, I mean, my children went on safari three times. They've mm. seen rhinos, elephants, giraffes, <laughs> um, leopards, lions up front, right in the, I mean, right there on, on the plains, you know, wow. in, in this safari. So, um, yeah, so those yeah, are this- the things. That's a lot of a lot of people have not had that kind of experience. So yeah, that's that sounds like an experience of a lifetime for them. Yeah, they're they've become very compassionate. Um, it's actually been quite a challenge for them coming back, living into a first world country. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually been really challenging, to be honest with you, uh, because they're you're free to roam. You're free. You have this whole beautiful country. Mm-hmm. Um, you have people that are constantly loving on you. Um, these people know how to connect. Their gift is, is that they love and they walk by faith and they care. I mean, we would walk into people's homes that didn't even know us and they would, their first question would be, are you happy? Mm. We don't even think wow. no. to ask that of one another. We don't even consider, oh, is this person happy? What can I do? to bring them happiness today. And that was their whole culture. I mean, these people that were in poverty, they would, they would run next door to their neighbor and ask for sugar just so that they could give us tea when we would come into their home, you know, and we would know that they would have nothing. So we would have to start to say, we're just coming to visit where we don't want tea because we didn't want to, you know, but they would literally do that. They would sacrifice wow. anything that they could so that they could just have sugar so that they could have milk and sugar and serve us tea, even though it would have put them in a bad place for a week or two or three. Wow. They value human like people. Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't just for us. It was for one another, you know, mm-hmm. um, and they, you, I mean, you want to learn how to be a community, you go to a third world country, you go to Kenya. Yeah, they have their things. Everybody has their things. You right. know? Um, and I mean, especially in America, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which they look to, they think America is perfect, that Americans right. are perfect, you know? Yeah, so land say, of no, milk and honey. Poverty. <laughs> 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 we have all these things. They would just, they would look at me like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. And you guys have something that a lot of us don't have in America. You have community Mm. and you have faith Mm -hmm. and you love one another and you care about each other in a very deep way, you know? So, yeah. Um, I I think everyone ought to experience that kind of uh, community somehow. I'm not sure how, how you could make that all happen other than just changing yourself and and offering that maybe in in your neighborhood but it it would be hard for us all to go to Kenya to experience that I would think but you you can have I love what you're saying you can have the same experience just by looking in your own community and being willing to see what the needs are mm-hmm. and being willing to have conversations being willing to get out of your comfort zone, um, to offer assistance because you don't have to be in Kenya to have that experience. It's just caring and connecting with another person. We have home, we have people all around us. I mean, and the, the interesting thing is, is I experienced after coming home, um, I had the experience of then going through a divorce and, and coming into being a single mom. And it was really interesting, Jay, because God really said to me, let people help you. When we were ready, when we were getting ready to come home and I did not want to come home, Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay. I wanted to make Kenya my home. Um, But when I was getting ready, um, I had the very strong impression and heard the words in my mind, let people help you. And I was like, okay, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and so I have been on the other side of that this year and it has been so humbling 
And it has been the most beautiful experience to be on the other side of receiving and having that come full circle where literally gave um, to the very like, it's almost to where my health was, you know, at yeah. its, at its word. Um, and then coming back and, and being on the, the other side of that, where people stepped into such compassion and such love and such community to support me through now the experience that I was going through of our family having to adjust from being in a third world country, from our family having to now adjust being in separate households, for me having to adjust going, you know, going through this and coming into single parenthood um, Mm -hmm. and all of that. And then being able to experience community, you know, showing up. I, I would not have been able to even come into the place that I am right now without that community. And so there's people all around, there's opportunities all around. You can create the experience that we had in Kenya. I mean, not the culture, but um, the connection and the caring just by looking around, you know, and following your intuition. We know when people are hurting, even though they're putting on a face (laughs) and it's the courage to look at someone in the eye, really look at them and say, how are you really? And is there something I can do to assist yeah. you? Yeah. It's so often we say, as someone asks us how we are, Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah. And having, having the courage in you to say, Oh, this is really what's happening to me. And this is really where I could use some help. And, and do you know of how, I can get help with this or can you help me with this? That's it's, it's so hard. I've, I've been through that same thing is how I don't want to ask for help. I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm the proud guy. And that Mm -hmm. sometimes is our problem is we're too proud to, to want to ask for the help we really need because we can't do it all ourselves. Well, we can't. And what I've learned is we're not meant to, Right. And something that has really helped me um, even now is to realize that when I um, when I withhold from allowing people uh, to assist me, especially when they offer. And I this is something I'm still I am still working on even even now, even this morning, I realized, oh, my gosh you know, God brought this person into my life and he offered to help me with A, B, C, and D. And I didn't receive as fully. Had I done that, it would have really helped me with where I'm at now. So even right now, but something that has also helped me, um, and this is a good reminder for me, is to realize that when we uh, don't receive or we're not allowing ourselves to receive, then we're actually withholding a blessing we're withholding an experience for someone else yeah. because we we really want to experience love in this life i truly believe that that is one of our greatest purposes here and one of the reasons that we are here is to learn how to give love in a pure way and how to receive love yeah. and but the two go together it's a cycle if right. you're giving love but you're not receiving then you're, you're depriving someone of an experience. And that is something that really helped me where it was like, you know, we gave and gave and gave in Kenya. And had they not been willing to receive all that we wanted to give, we would not have had such a beautiful experience. And yeah. so coming here, it was like, if I am not willing to receive everything that these people are offering, then I am depriving them of having that beautiful experience of them experiencing themselves as a loving human being. Mm. And that is what I want for people. I want to experience myself and I got to experience myself as a beautiful, loving human being. And it was the most beautiful experience. So why would I want to deprive someone else of them experiencing themselves as a loving, compassionate, giving human being. And so that has helped me to be like, okay, I receive. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. Well, um, we're about to the end of, of our time here. Is there any final thoughts that you'd like to to add on top of what the, the great message you've shared so far? No, I just really appreciate the opportunity to speak from my heart and to just share some of the experiences and the truths that I've learned. Um, I do want to invite your listeners. I do have a blog. Um, if I can invite them to, to just at least, um, because my greatest desire is to just share what's in my heart. Um, and so I do have a blog, um, and it is on my website, um, uh, www.joyfilledfamilies.com. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll put all the, all the contact information you want, uh, we'll put in the show notes so people can go back to it. Not everybody's listening in a place where they can write things down. So we'll put those in the show notes. So that was my next question is how do people get a hold of you? Um, and so we'll, your, your website and, and your blog sound like they would be a, a good place for people to, to get to understand your message more. They, they can, and they can even go on. Um, I do free 30 minute consultations, um, just assisting people to learn how to connect better with themselves, mm-hmm. um, and create joy in their lives. Um, I am a transformational coach and a spiritual life coach. Um, and it's all about me just helping people connect within themselves. And so if they, if they want to connect with me in that way, and they want to know more about what I'm doing or um, have a conversation with me, they can just, there's a space on there. They can leave their contact information and then I'll just contact them in the way that they are comfortable with um, just to make a connection. So. Okay. Fantastic. Well, um, thanks once again for taking your time to, to visit with me and to, to share your thoughts and your, your experiences. And uh, we'll, we'll get your message out as best I can, my 32 listeners. And <laughs> That's 32 That's, individual souls. That's amazing. That's right. Well, we hope it's that many that gets this message, but we're, we're building. That's, that's the important more, more messages like this. I think will touch more people and, and they in turn will touch other people. We hope so. Um, I, I really do, do appreciate your time and, and, uh, um, I guess we'll call that another show today. So thanks again. As always, thank you for listening to rebuilding. I hope that you have heard something today that will help you on your path to rebuilding your life. If something resonated, if you felt a call to action, please take that action and rebuild. Let me know what you think of today's show or any of my shows. You can leave comments at rebuilding.podbean.com or email at j at jwalter.com. I would love to hear from you comments, suggestions, and topics that you would like me to cover are always welcome. Remember, a dream written down with a deadline is a goal, and a goal achieved is a dream come true. Until next time, I am Jay Walter, and I am always rebuilding.